Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. It is my goal here to help you think biblically, and by helping you think biblically, you're going to think different as you walk through this world. And part of that is helping us think different about church. There are so many things that I think over the years, especially here in America, that we have built up as things that have to be a part of a church. But when you look in the scripture and you dig in and you just don't see all of it there. And so I want to challenge you today to rethink in some ways, rethink church. Not that we throw out biblical things. Biblical things are what we need to be doing. But church can look different depending on where you are, what your culture is. And today on my channel, I have a guest that I am excited to introduce you to. And we're going to talk about that. I have with me today, Bill Branks. He is a church planner in uh, in Corktown, if you don't know where Corktown is, that's uh, basically inner city Detroit for for us outsiders. Uh, and uh, Bill has a blog that I enjoy subscribing to and, and reading, and we'll give you an opportunity later on in the video to figure out where that is and and be able to do that as well. But Bill, you posted a a blog called Cold Hearted Baptism, and it really, um, as I read that one, it 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 spoke exactly to what I have been kind of thinking through and, and what I mentioned in the opening uh, about a baptism that you were having and uh, and just the response from that you were kind of afraid you might get from uh, somebody that was there from an established church and uh, that response was different than you thought than you maybe thought that it was going to be take a minute and just kind of maybe work us through that account through that story and then uh, share that and we'll, we'll go from there on that conversation okay. Well, the, the cold-hearted baptism, it, it doesn't sound, it's not as bad as that sounds. <laughs> uh, you, you'll understand when I, but that's, that's the point of a title, kind of get your attention. But we were uh, in an old building, a very old building, about 100 years old, and we were on the third floor. And we were a fairly new church. We had 25, 30 people. And we had a couple of folks, three of them, who came to know the Lord and, uh, I just felt it was as soon as they were ready and they understood the purpose of, of baptism by immersion that we would do that. And I didn't feel there was any reason to delay that uh, mm-hmm. for a particular type of baptistry or church or uh, anything like that. Right. I mean, we live in Detroit, so I'm not going to take them to the Detroit River. Uh, I wouldn't do that to anybody <laughs> to baptize them. I mean, you can you can walk on water over there and you don't have to be Jesus. So it's it's, it's pretty rough water. But uh, so we uh, we ended up getting an inflatable hot tub uh, to to do the baptism, and we we got it up to the third floor. We filled it up, and uh, and like most men, I didn't read the directions till it was too late. Uh, I pulled out the <laughs> the heater, the water heater, the immersion heater, and right there in big bold letters it said, uh, "Begin heating 24 hours before use." <laughs> And I was about an hour before use. <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> and, yeah, whoops is right. But of course, I didn't tell the folks that we, I was going to baptize. We, we, my wife and I were scrambling to heat up as much water as we could. I mean, we were microwaving uh, bowls and we were running water through the coffee machine without coffee. I mean, we were doing everything we possibly could to get this water temperature tolerable. And uh, we didn't succeed. So I said, well, maybe it'll warm up to room temperature by the time we have the baptism. Uh, but I knew this was, it was unusual, uh, mm-hmm. because it's, a, we're an inner city church. We've got inner city people. You know, we really didn't have, well, we didn't have any kind of a dress code. We weren't going to put those kind of restrictions on people. Right. We got homeless people, you name it. Uh, you know, the first time I preached in Chicago, I wore a suit and, as I, as the people were leaving, a homeless guy said, that was a good sermon, Pastor, but do I have to dress like you to come to this church? And that was the last time mm-hmm. I wore a suit and right. tie because yeah. I didn't want people thinking that, well, we're here we are a couple of years later. I'm, you know, it's business casual. and um, But we had supporting churches from outside the city limits. And one of them was, uh, I'll just say it, it's a wealthy church, very large church, mm-hmm. Christian school. Uh absolutely gorgeous sanctuary and they had a baptistry that looked like a, a swimming pool i mean they could they could have baptized six people at once in that thing 
It had the lights and the whole, you know, it was amazing. I was, and and you've got a blow up baptistry basically at this point, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> I got a kiddie away. pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all we could do. But to me, it wasn't important what right. we baptized them in. It mm-hmm. was the fact that they were baptized and they had a, so, uh, so we went ahead with the baptism. We had a full house, a lot of family, friends were there, which was encouraging to me because they didn't care. We had a kiddie pool. They just wanted to see their family members right. baptized. Well, right towards uh, the end, I saw a man and, and a woman uh, dressed, well-dressed. They came in. Uh, they sat in the back. During the entire service, they had this very disapproving look on their face. And I thought, oh, is this a family member? Who is this? Uh, but we did the, the baptism. It went great. I mean, the people came up out of the water, and they looked at me like, do you know how cold that water is? And I said, I know. I'm standing up into my knees and I can't feel my feet. Yeah, I know how cold it is. I'm sorry, but you'll never forget your, your baptism. Right. So we got done. We had a little fellowship afterwards. And the, the man and woman that were well, you know, very well dressed. They walk up and, and he introduced himself and he said, I'm, I'm so and so from, from this church. And I thought, Oh no, they're, they're a supporting church and, we're doing this for baptism. Mm-hmm. He he is just going to rake me over the mm-hmm. coals and and just I'm going to hear all about how how sacrilegious this is and it's a mockery of baptism and on and on and on. So I was prepared for it, and I, I so I said, "Well, I appreciate you coming." And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, "Bill, this was refreshing." I I about fell over. I said, "Really?" He said, "Yes." He says, sometimes churches get stuck in how we look externally. And we spend, he didn't, he didn't talk about his own home church, but I, I'd been there. So I knew that mm-hmm. he was saying, you know, he probably sits in the pew of his own church and thinks, do we need all this? Mm-hmm. Is this important? Or is it more important for us to be obedient in believers baptism, uh, you know, to get them immersed so they can give their testimony and tell the rest of the church that they are in Christ that they're a member of the family of God and do that with, with joy. And it was just very encouraging to me because uh, I expected his response to be disapproving. But I so appreciated the fact that regardless of what, what and why their church does what they do, uh, he saw this as uh, a viable solution mm-hmm. to it, not really a problem, but we needed to do this. And I've thought about that conversation many, many times because, in fact, the pastor of that same church, uh, he says, you know, we always wanted to plant an inner city church, but we've, we've never gotten around to it. Can we just adopt you as our, as our daughter (laughs) church? And I said, sure. He goes, now I know you do things different down there. He says, but, but that's okay. And and I really didn't kind of press him on what he mean. But the bottom line is, you know, when I came to, uh, to Chicago first, I got off the, the subway and I didn't know what and how the Lord was going to do what he was going to do. But there were some things that we did know, that there are some irreducible minimums when it comes to a church. You know, our, our doctrine, right? Uh, I, I, you know, what we're teaching, what the goal, what the ministry, our philosophy of ministry. I said, I need to decide on, on what the non-negotiables are. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we'll see what the Lord does. You know, who am I to dictate, uh, well, we, we have to dress this way or meet at this time or sing these songs or use these instruments when I have no idea who the Lord is going to bring. Right. And if I try to use those personal preferences uh, to influence who comes through the door, I'm not doing it right. I say, well, we're going to have this kind of music, this kind of worship team, and we're going to have, uh, and, and then because we want to bring in the, uh, we want to appeal to the Gen X and, and the younger people. We want them coming in. So we got to have all this stuff. I said, what you need to have is a heart that's willing to talk to and reach anybody that walks through your door and not kind of, you know, shake your head when it's a homeless guy. Or uh, one of the things that I'd say a lot is, I said, when we go to other churches and we're presenting our ministry, I say, um, you know, my wife and I are happy when everybody is sober on Sunday morning. <laughs> and when I say that, everybody laughs, uh, just like you are. <laughs> right. Everybody laughs. But it's a reality say, for you. I'll say, I'm not kidding. Right. We are happy when everybody's sober because mm-hmm. many Sundays that's not the case. And that's just one more thing to deal with. 
we don't ask the ushers to drag them out into the street and, you know, and force right. feed them coffee and bring them back in. Uh, because you, you just, you want people to be able to feel welcome. And you think of Christ's ministry, uh, there weren't church plant models per se. You had a group of believers, true born again Christ followers, and they would meet anywhere outside the synagogue in somebody's home, mm -hmm. out, in the, out in the field. They would meet anywhere. You know, from what we know from scripture, there weren't any church models other than the gospel of Jesus right. Christ. And the, it, it, I mean, so it's very limited. And they were figuring I it out. <laughs> that's right. It was, like I said, they were building the ship at sea. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying you don't have a plan, but you hold on to it loosely. It's got to be flexible because if you say, I just want to carve out this demographic, that's all the people I want to minister to. I, I can, I guarantee you, because I did the same thing. The Lord's going to say, you're going to love whoever, you need to love whoever I send you. Uh, because our first few Sundays were nothing but guys from the YMCA, homeless, off the street. And I told my wife, I said, we're not a mission. This is supposed to be a church. What are we doing? And I have to confess that when the Aziz guys came in, I was always kind of looking over their heads for the normal people, the ones that, that mm. were sober, that mm -hmm. had their Bibles, that, that had bathed that morning, you know. Those are the people that I wanted to build my church on. And and the Lord very clearly showed me over a matter of time. He says, if you're not willing to, to love and, and minister to these people, I'm not going to send you the people that you're looking for. Because your call is to minister to whoever walks through that door. And, and, and that was a huge mm. shift in gears for me to say, you know, the way a church has to be, is a lot smaller than a lot of church planters think today. I mean, you could spend a fortune on church planting books, on church planting models. Right. And I'm not saying that that's all bad, but if you're looking for a perfect recipe for a perfect church, it's not out there. Uh, we have to lower our expectations. By that, I mean have those non-negotiables. Uh, you know, the the Word of God is our cornerstone. That's what we preach from. That's not negotiable. You know, our worship is going to be reverent. We're going to, uh, we're going to feed people. We're going to love people. We're not going to judge people. That's the philosophy of ministry. That's it. the things that I put down and said, if these things change about this church, I'll leave. I'll resign as the mm -hmm. pastor because this isn't, this isn't the, the body of believers. This isn't the church that I feel the Lord uh, expects out of us. And it's really us reaching out and, and not having our own desires and our own expectations for, um, for what say, people say, Hey, I'll, I'll be a church planner if I can do it here or here. It'd yeah. be cool to have one in New York city. It'd be cool to have one in Denver or, or, or whatever, but don't do it because it's cool. Do it because the Lord has called you to a specific group of people. And uh, if I, I'll just add one more thing, Josh, you know, for me, I was in business for many, many years, and it, it was drilled into my head that, you know, success was all about the numbers, you know, profit and growth, <laughs> and, and you, you kind of yeah. drill it into your head. And then to switch into church planting, uh, it's still all about the numbers. Right. I was going to say, it hasn't and, changed uh, as pastors, has it? That's what's drilled into our head. That, that's right. But it's, it's not. It, to me, it's, you know, I had to learn, and it took a long time. I had a, pa or a, a pastor tell me once, he said, don't worry about who's not there on Sunday, worry about who's there. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a simple f statement, but it was <laughs> yeah. just a, a game changer for me because I was. I'm like, oh man, we had, we had 52 people last week. Now we only got 40. What's going on? I mean, you will just, uh, it's got to be about these people made that decision to be there this morning. That's who you need to minister to. Right. That's who you build a church around. Yep. And in 15 years, uh, we've never had more than 70 people. And, uh, and if, if I had told you as I was starting church planning, oh, that's not acceptable. I need to have, you know, constantly growing year mm -hmm. after year. And if, if that can happen, great. It hasn't for us. We've got inner city people. We're ministering to whoever God brings us because that's our mission. The Lord has provided for us. I mean, in 15 years, our offerings, 
have never met the budget for the church. Mm. But we've we've always paid the bill. The Lord always moved and somebody always moved someone to uh, to pay the bills for us. It's not just the financial aspect, but to let go of my idea of what this church is going to look like and say, I'm going to do my best to speak truth in these people's lives, whether there's two or or 200. Uh, and I think church planters have to have that mindset. It's more of a missionary mindset than a, a business model. And, and right. too many of them today, they're not church plant models or business models. Yes. And I, I agree. I, I, think, I agree that with, with many churches, not just church plants. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the yeah. things that struck me, I, I preached through Acts not too long ago. And uh, you talk about, you know, this, this church, you have to be a church planner. Well, one of the people we would consider to be one of the greatest church planners of all time, Paul, you know, when you, when you study Acts and see what he did and, and how the Lord guided him or even the, uh, the apostles before Paul came on the scene, sure, there was Pentecost and there were some times where there was large crowds and, and, and you know, God did some, some pretty neat things. But the majority of Acts, if you pay attention, God is doing his work through Paul reaching one or two people at a time. It's not about the crowds. It's about the people that are in front of you. And and I love that you talk about that. That's something that I have really, um, I just don't worry about the amount of people that are there. And and I've learned, you know, you've probably been there too. You prepare a sermon and then <laughs> there's a couple people you're like, man, I wish they would have been here today. And you just realize, you know what? No, the Lord, the Lord has a plan and I'm going to, I'm going to minister to the people that are here. And it, it really keeps you from, uh, having a lot of unnecessary stress because you can't really control what they do anyway. So, <laughs> right, right. I, we had a, a quick story here. We had a one of our early Sundays when we normally had fifty or sixty people there. I, we went through the worship time, and and there, there was one person there in the back. Uh, went through the worship time, went through announcements, and I was determined to just go ahead like as if the place was full. And I got up, opened my Bible prayed and start to preach and uh and there was just that one guy my wife was was in another room with uh with the nursery and so it was just one guy sitting all the way in the back so i started to preach well by the time we were done i mean if people in, in the inner city they're notorious for being late so by the time i you know halfway through the sermon we probably had 25 people there so uh if anybody's feeling sorry for me <laughs> but so they did they did wander in but when we got done, that guy that was sitting in the back, he came up to me. He goes, he goes. I thought there's no way a pastor's going to start preaching with just me sitting here. I said, "What do you think I was going to do? Cancel the service?" You know, <laughs> I said, "You know, you just this is what the Lord ordained, mm -hmm. and and so you you benefited. <laughs> I hope you heard the whole sermon. Everybody else heard half a sermon." I said, "But." It, it, I think it's decisions that we make that the Lord tends to honor. That said, I've worked all week on this sermon, and I'm going to preach it. Mm. You know, it would have been very easy to say, ah, "Hey, buddy, hey, Henry, come back next week. Right. We'll, I'll just do it then. Let's just we'll have a prayer time." And we kind of, you know, we. But that's that's pride. It's it's all our. What's the what's the point? This right. is my effort, and I want to make it count. So I'm not going to preach to just one person, uh, but the, the reality you know, I, is, I, God I, had you prepare that sermon for Him that day, though. Absolutely, and yep. and so you know, I'm. We have to. It's, it's not about us, you know. It, it's really not even about who's there. The Lord is going to ordain the sermon. He's going to ordain mm -hmm. who hear it, and that's our job to be faithful. Uh, and I've said for years, if I ever write a book about church planting, it's it's going to be, uh, what do you do when all you have is faithfulness to show for your faithfulness? <laughs> <laughs> 15 years in the ministry, uh, and I'd love to say, oh, yeah, I got I got 20 church planted, and that, but we stay faithful, and right. we don't question what the Lord is, is doing. We seek wisdom and guidance and, and move forward. But what you have to show for it is people... You, you might not have a, a huge church that's graduated. You can say, yeah, I have this church. But you have people over those many years that would point back and say, hey, there, there was this church. There was this pastor. And because they were faithful, they changed my life. And, yeah. and that's the key. Yeah. And I agree. You know, when I get discouraged, 
uh, the Lord will use this, even from our church in Chicago 10 years ago. I'll, in fact, there's a guy who wrote me on Facebook. He said, yeah, I was moving and I was unpacking a box and I, I saw a bunch of my sermon notes from when you were at River North and I just sat down and started reading them and, and I had a couple questions. I said, nine <laughs> years later, you had a couple questions. <laughs> but I mean, we, it was a good conversation mm-hmm. we went on, but I thought we, we will never know how the Lord right. used. Uh, so we, to throw in the towel at any time, um, you know, I told my wife, I said, the Lord's going to have to kick, you know, drag me kicking and screaming uh, out of this because I want to stay faithful. I mm-hmm. need to know that it's the Lord's will, like we did when we went from Chicago to Detroit. This is what the Lord wants. You know, I, I, I can't say that I wanted it, but the Lord just made it very, very clear mm. that it was time. He, he was done with us after right. 10 years in Chicago, and, and we moved on to what was next. And I just want to be able to stand before the Lord with boldness and reverence. I was faithful. I kept at it. Mm-hmm. You, had to, you had to hit me in the head with a club to get me to stop. You know, that's, that's the kind of right. commitment we need, and I continue to, to ask the Lord for that. I think that's great. And, and, uh, actually, I'd love that, uh, this, this conversation turn maybe from, from where I was going to take it. But this is such a good conversation, Bill. And I appreciate that. And I'm thankful the Lord kind of took it that way and that you went, went down that road of faithfulness, especially because, uh, there are a lot of times that as Christians, we jump into ministry and we have these grand ideas. Uh, I was ta- thinking about it when you were talking about it. Uh, where I am here now as senior pastor, one of the hardest things, for me in coming here was feeling like when I left where I was, um, I hadn't accomplished what I went there to accomplish. And then I had to realize, wait a minute, I was the one that wanted to accomplish that. God said, no, you've accomplished what I have for you there. And I have, have something else for you. And, uh, what an encouraging conversation just about being faithful and, and trusting what God's plan is for our life, life instead of our own. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we could put that first rather than, I mean, all the other stuff comes along, whether it's a church model or not a church model. Hmm. Ours is called the parachute model. My wife and I just dropped into the city and <laughs> started Bible study, started Bible studies. And, uh, again, I wouldn't, you know, recommend that put a team together, but still, um, I, I think we can get hung up on, you can study the blueprint yeah. forever, but you're never going to get the church built until you get out in the field. Right. So, right. So just get off, get, you know, so, get off the desk. <laughs> so here's, here's an interesting thing that, uh, I'm getting ready to, to preach through Titus, um, here in a, in a few weeks. And I've just been studying Titus and enjoying that. Um, I don't know how you feel about Titus, but I, I believe Titus is really what we could consider a church planting book. Um, mm-hmm. it seems as though Paul has left Titus there to finish kind of these little church plants that Paul had started. And we were talking about that the other day, and uh, somebody that we both know, um, you know Brad, brought up the uh, the thought that um, Timothy and Titus both were had this kind of the same relationship with Paul. The greeting and the and the purpose of those books are two different things. In in Timothy, uh, it, it, as Paul writes to Timothy, he's talking a lot about the polity of the church, but that's an older church. And when he's in Titus, you know, and this conversation came up because I was just kind of working through that in a Bible study, showing that here's what's important in a in a church. You know, you talked earlier about what are the things that I will not give in on. Well, I think Titus has those things. Here are the things that we cannot we cannot compromise on. How we get to those things is a completely different story. And uh, he just brought up this idea that that look, this is Paul is writing here to a to young churches. Let's get the main things down. But the problem is, what I find is, I think we have, even as established churches, we forget about the main thing, and we focus too much on all the polity. Um, when I, a couple of, so I guess it was last summer, I was able to go on what was kind of a, a survey trip of church plants. In fact, I was able to visit your church there in Corktown during that time. And I think almost every missionary said, uh, kind of what that pastor said about your church. And they, they said, when we got there, they said, well, our church doesn't look like the typical church. And that bothered me because I thought, have we, have we put church in such a box that now we have this typical church? And we shouldn't do that. If we're doing the main things, the non-negotiables, then the other stuff doesn't matter. It's, it's however it works in our culture, however we 
I mean, maybe we don't have the people to, to run the great programs. Well, that doesn't matter because the programs aren't what's important. What's important are the people and how we get there. And uh, really, that's where I wanted, where, why, why I, I drove, you know, wanted to have this conversation. But man, what an encouraging conversation about faithfulness in the middle of all of that. And uh, if you guys were encouraged by that, uh, I want you to uh, go check out Bill's blog. I'm going to give him just a minute here. Go ahead and talk about that real quick, Bill, your blog. And I'm going to, the, the link is down in the description so you guys can, can find that. And I would highly encourage you, go subscribe for more stories and more, uh, I guess we could call it conversation on paper like this, right? Go, go ahead and talk about it a little bit. Okay. Well, the, the, the blog is just a series of, of articles that are grow out of my experiences in the inner city ministry. Each one is a story. They're true stories. The, the Tuesday true tales, I call them. And it's my interaction with the people or, or something would happen. And sometimes it's my, some things in my own life that, that were kind of weird and, and the Lord intervened or they were just an example to me of, of how this is an illustration of, of life and how the Lord speaks through everyday events. Uh, but we, our, our church, Common Grounds in Corktown, has we have a coffee shop up front, and we meet in the back. It's a small place. We've got about 40, 40 50 people, and we have people come in. And one of the stories, uh, Josh, that you were talking about is we've had people come in, and, and I should say a lot of my stories about people that come into the coffee shop thinking that it's just a coffee mm. shop. And so we begin to talk, and, and they'll, at some point they'll go, now, wait a minute, is this a coffee shop with a church? Or is it a church with a coffee shop? <laughs> and I said, well, what, what do you think it is? <laughs> I mean, because right What do you now, want it to be? <laughs> yeah, right now it's just a coffee shop because yeah. you haven't come to church yet. Right. But when I explain our what we're trying to do, we're trying to open a door on the West Lafayette, this, on the streets of Detroit, so people will come in, and they do. You know, they come in all all walks of life. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, the kind of the people that we've talked to. But they come in and they see the the little sanctuary worship area in the back and say, what is this? I said, well, it's, we've got this coffee shop and we're not even a business. It's all vo- volunteers, mm-hmm. donations. We just make coffee, give cookies to whoever comes in. So I explain the whole thing and they go, wow, that's weird. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's great, isn't it? And they always <laughs> say yes. I mean, so many times, this goes back to what you're saying about, you know, the things that get in the way of a church being a church. And and I want people to think what we're doing is weird because it's not like your typical church. I mean, we there's a huge uh, Catholic cathedral about a quarter of a mile from us. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but you know, people, don't, it's not full. I mean, it's more of a mission now. And I just you think if people are looking, and it's not just that church; they could be looking at church, but they're not finding it. If they don't go because, well, it kind of looks like a church, but I don't like what I'm hearing. But the people that have come to Common Grounds and stay, they say, I really like what I'm hearing, but this is kind of a weird thing. I I, I do it on purpose because I want to break those molds that people have. People won't come into, a, uh, people that might not come into a, a standard church format or setting or a, a, a churchy looking building. They'll walk into Common Grounds and, and to, to see us and see the coffee shop. And then when I explain to them at church, my, I tell people all this. I said, my objective is get people from the coffee shop into the church. And that might take one invitation. It <laughs> might take six months. Right. Uh, but the idea is people are looking for something. I think they're looking for truth. They want to know that mm-hmm. they're not being lied to. They right. want to know genuine love and truth being taught from the word and it's what encouraged me most about our people is is they will say i'm here because i I preach verse by verse and i'm not trying to pat myself on the back because anybody can do it or just about anybody but i stick to a verse by verse Mm -hmm. as exegetical approach and because they want they they don't say this but they need spoon feeding like we all do at times and they really feel like they're understanding scripture one verse by one verse, and they've been coming this so long. They say, "I don't care if we're meeting out in the parking lot," if, and we have. We've met at sandwich shops. I mean, we've met everywhere until we got our own place. Um, that's what holds people together. And I, I don't know yeah. who it was, but it, it was brilliant when they said, 
whatever brings them to church is going to keep them to church. Yes, keep them at so church. true. Yep. So if, if they come in for the music in the coffee, in the, you know, the coffee shop, they're not going to come. But if they're if they're getting fed, um, they're going to come back for that. And that's what to keep them there. And, and that's kind of our aim. Well, I've appreciated this conversation. Thanks for the time. Bill, and once again, I'm I'm going to just tell you he could give you the the website, but it's you're not going to remember us. So just jump down in the description, and uh, and find it there. I know he would appreciate it, but you will be uh, encouraged. You'll be challenged from uh, just stories from his years of inner city church planning, and then uh, on Saturdays, just uh, a little devotional through the through Psalm. What is it? Well, Psalm one nineteen, right. Yeah, two so, verses at a time. So uh, small bites. So it's it, it's going to be a little while. <laughs> He's going to be in there too. So <laughs> right. so jump in and and do that. So thanks again, Bill. Really appreciate it. Thank and you. Uh, if my you guys pleasure. are if you guys are brand new to my channel, I want to say thanks for watching. And uh, if you want more content similar to this, uh, if you want content that's biblical and helps you think through the world in a biblical way, that, therefore, we kind of just talked about it, different, right? We want to be different and, and weird, <laughs> weird and different, but, <laughs> but biblical. And okay. if you want that, then hit the subscribe button and uh, make sure you, you hit the like button as well. And feel free to share this with anybody you think it might encourage. We'll see you next time. Bye.